I think it's a safe assessment to say that most people don't like jazz. And pop culture makes this pretty clear. Even jazz enthusiasts understand that their music is an acquired taste, and I think the best example of this are all the Giant Steps memes that were popular a few years ago. The reason that people thought these were funny is because they knew that any normal person would think it sounds terrible to take John Coltrane's chord changes and put them on some pop song. But jazz listeners got the enjoyment of claiming that it was good music. We spent almost all of human history making music more organized, more structured, and classical music was the peak of this. But in the last 100 years, jazz has thrown all of that away. Is this some kind of manifestation of the second law of thermodynamics in our culture? Are we destined for art to become more chaotic and abstract? Why do people like jazz at all? Or an even better question, why do humans like music at all? And this is a hard question to answer because there's seemingly unrelated aspects of music, right? Rhythm, melody, harmony. If there was any theory that attempted to explain why we like music, it would need to link all three of these together. I'll give you a spoiler, we don't have that explanation yet. I can't tell it to you in this video because it's just something we don't know. But although it's not nicely wrapped together in one theory, we do have some well-educated biological reasons for liking different aspects of music. In this video we'll look at some of the evolutionary and physiological reasons that we play music, and we'll also look at some of the math and physics that our brains experience when we listen to it. Soon after Charles Darwin introduced his theory of natural selection, he himself tried to apply it to humans' interest in music. His theory was that early humans used song to attract mates, like in birds, or cicadas, or more closely related gibbons. He didn't provide a physical benefit to our survival that music would have given us, but that's okay because sexual selection often exaggerates traits that wouldn't have any purpose otherwise. In Steven Pinker's book How the Mind Works, he argues that music is evolutionary cheesecake. Humans, of course, wouldn't have any reason to enjoy cheesecake in the wild, but there were incentives to have a taste for sugar and fats and oils, so cheesecake is a byproduct of these other adaptations. Pinker's hypothesis is that music never served any purpose to humans. It's simply a byproduct of our linguistic ability, and our ability to process sounds and find dangers in the environment, and the natural rhythms in our bodies. Because our brains adapted to do the things that music has, Music is just this indulgence of ours. I'm not entirely convinced. But Pinker is getting somewhere with the mental adaptations he mentions that might have led to music. Especially with the influence that motor control has on a sense of rhythm. The human leg is essentially a pendulum, so it has a specific resonant frequency. When used correctly, our legs can be very efficient. In fact, you could make a simple walking device that's powered only by gravity. Even when walking on flat land or uphill, it takes an impressively small amount of energy to move our bodies, but only when we're walking in time with our legs' resonant frequency, so gravity can do most of the work. The better our sense of rhythm, the more efficiently we move. Ostriches are also bipedal, but we don't see them playing drums. So what's different about us? We have two legs, but we're also social creatures. We hunted and gathered in groups. Footsteps are pretty loud, and when you have a group of, say, a dozen humans, all walking at possibly different rates, they're working hard, so they're all breathing loudly, possibly at different rates, then it starts to mask out important sounds, like prey stepping on a twig, or a snake in the bushes. One thing we can do to alleviate this problem is we can synchronize our steps and our breathing with other members of the group. If all of these predictable sounds are lined up with each other, then that gives us spaces of silence to listen to our environment. It also makes it easier for our brain to filter out unimportant sounds because they're predictable. This would have incentivized two adaptations. One is for us to synchronize our steps, our breathing, tapping a finger, with the people around us and with the sounds that we hear. This is still observed in people today. The other is for our brain to become better at recognizing and locking on to sound sources with different tempos, and becoming comfortable with those in order to filter them out. Now this starts to look a lot like music. Proponents of this theory believe that not only would this have given us the skills we need to play music, it would have also required us to play music in groups in order to practice these abilities. Some modern cultures even recognize this practical value that music has. For example, drumming traditions of the Awe people in West Africa. Awe music relies on very complex polyrhythms. A musician might be playing a rhythm like this with one hand, and their other hand, or another musician, might be playing a 4 beat pattern underneath. Simultaneously, there might be a 6 beat pattern that's being played. 
and still there could be a two beat pattern, a three beat pattern, any of these could be offset by a beat. It gets very complicated and there's a lot going on. This music acts as a kind of moral education. The belief is that by practicing until you're comfortable with these conflicting rhythms, you're preparing yourself for the inevitable conflicts of life. If you focus on one rhythm, or if you block the others out, then that's a sign of mental weakness. You're avoiding reality. We get valuable mental exercise by playing complex music. Around 500 BC, Pythagoras carried out some experiments with a monochord, an instrument with one string and a movable bridge in the middle. He concluded that when the ratio between the lengths of the strings could be expressed as small integers, the sound was consonant. It sounded good. But when the ratio could only be simplified to high integers, it sounds dissonant, conflicting. String length is inversely proportional to frequency, so this could be said about any sounds. The tuning of scales varies between different cultures, but universally, music features at least some notes that fall in these low integer ratios, especially when we play chords, multiple notes at the same time. So the observation that Pythagoras made holds up. We like chords with simple frequency ratios. But why? Once sound reaches your ear, it vibrates your eardrum, which in turn vibrates the ossicles, three bones that pass these vibrations along to your cochlea. Inside the cochlea is the basilar membrane, and this is a strip of tissue that runs along the length of the cochlea. The basilar membrane is designed so that the stiffness and other properties vary along its length, so different parts of it resonate at different frequencies. Near the base of the cochlea, it responds best to high frequencies, and at the tip, it responds best to low frequencies. All along the basilar membrane are these sensors, called hair cells. Because they're each in a different position on the membrane, they each respond best to a different frequency. So effectively, the cochlea performs a Fourier transform. It separates audio signals into different frequencies. Each hair cell is connected to a neuron, which sends a signal to the brain, saying that it heard this frequency. Neurons communicate primarily through electrical signals. When a neuron receives chemicals called neurotransmitters from a sensory cell or from another neuron, those trigger ion gates, which move positively charged potassium and sodium ions inside and outside of the neuron. So there's a flow of current into the neuron. At the same time, all the charges that are accumulating on the inside and outside of the neuron are only separated by the thin cell membrane, so this forms a capacitor on the edge of the neuron, and the current source is charging up this capacitor. Of course, the cell membrane isn't perfect at holding back the ions, so some of the charges are going to leak through. This means that the membrane acts as a resistor. So now we've turned our neuron into an RC circuit, and we can analyze it just like we would in a physics class. The key value that we're interested in is the voltage across the membrane. The reason that we're interested in that is because once this reaches a certain threshold, it'll trigger voltage-gated ion channels to discharge the neuron, and then it'll send neurotransmitters to the next neuron and repeat the whole process. So here's the equation for our neuron. The input current which again depends on the other neurons and sensory cells that our neuron is connected to, equals the leakage current plus the charging. And both of these depend on the voltage, which is what we want to solve for. I realize this might feel long-winded, but I promise this all comes back to music. So let's say you're listening to a chord with two notes, and they're both pure frequencies. That means that two of your hair cells are being triggered, and each one of those sends a signal to one sensory neuron. We'll say these two sensory neurons hook up to one interneuron, which takes a signal to your brain. What we're going to do is we'll take our neuron equation and apply it to these three neurons. The hope is that once we solve it, we'll be able to plug in different frequencies for different chords, and hopefully we'll see some difference in the signal that goes to your brain between good chords and bad chords. So we'll start with neuron number one. Since it's connected to a hair cell, the input is just a sine wave at whatever frequency the note is. But there's also a lot of noise in our brains. There's so many random factors that could change the input current, so we'll also add a term here that represents random noise. Neuron number two is exactly the same, but with a different frequency for a different note. Neuron number three gets its input from the first two neurons, and again, the way it works is the input neurons will normally send close to zero current until they fire, then they'll instantaneously send a pulse of current. So we'll use a Dirac delta function to model this. It's a function that's zero everywhere except at the moment the neurons fire. 
Of course, we'll have to solve for neurons 1 and 2 to figure out those times. This system of equations can be and has been solved. Um, and here's the solution. I don't think it's particularly enlightening. So in, instead of solving it, let me walk you through what typically happens. And I say typically because that noise that we included makes the solution slightly random. The current signal coming from the hair cell is generally not high enough to trigger the sensory neurons on its own. So it takes the addition of our noise to actually fire. During the first cycle of the sound wave that we're listening to, the neuron is charging up, so the moment that it's most likely to fire first is at the peak of the sine wave when the current input is highest. If it didn't happen to fire at that time, then the next most likely chance is going to be at the next peak. So if we make a probability distribution of the sensory neuron's firing times, it'll look something like this. A high peak after one cycle of the sound wave, and then they get smaller after that. On neuron number three, the input from a single sensory neuron is also generally not high enough to trigger it. And because of the resistor, or charges, leaking across the cell membrane, if there's no constant current input, then it'll eventually discharge. So in order for neuron number three to fire, it needs to receive a signal from one neuron, and then really soon after receive a signal from the other neuron. This needs to happen before it has time to discharge. So the more often the signals from neuron 1 and neuron 2 line up, the more often neuron 3 will fire and send a signal to your brain. We can use this to make a probability distribution of neuron number 3's firing times, but of course it depends on the relationship between the two frequencies that you're hearing. So here are some probability distributions for small integer chords. You can see that they're pretty regular. The signal that your brain gets is organized and predictable. But here are some probability distributions for large integer chords. As you can see, they're much more fuzzy. It's not predictable when that neuron is going to fire. We actually have a way of measuring this fuzziness. It's called information entropy, or Shannon entropy, after its inventor. To introduce it, let me show you this picture. This is the Arecibo message, and in 1974 we sent this picture through radio waves into the cosmos. I guess as an attempt to introduce ourselves to whatever aliens might find it. But pretend that you're an alien and your job is to watch the data from a radio telescope and notify someone if you see a signal that looks like it's from aliens. Most days you'll just see something like this, random noise. But then one day you see this. Which one of these signals gives you more information? Clearly this one. Even though you don't know the meaning, it's so organized that it must be an intelligent message. See, you already have an intuition for entropy. A signal that appears more organized is more likely to contain information. A high entropy signal like this is probably just noise, but a low entropy signal like this tells us something. If you were just shown each of these signals, then the low entropy one carries more information. Now here's the counterintuitive part. Let's say that you know that both of these signals are from aliens. They're both intentional. Now, which one gives you more information? This one does. The one with higher entropy. See, the low entropy organized signal follows simple rules. You could recreate it by only knowing a few things, but to recreate the high entropy signal, you would need to know each bit. So you actually gain more information by understanding the messy signal. The messy signal is ambiguous, but decoding it ultimately gives you more information. The entropy of neural signals reaching your brain is low for consonant low integer chords. It's high for dissonant high integer chords. And this makes sense in a lot of ways. I mean, if you hear a C major chord on a piano, then of course it was intentional. It carries a simple message and it's unlikely to happen by chance. Somebody is probably reading music and playing it. On the other hand, if you hear three adjacent chromatic notes, then it could just be that something fell on the piano. On the surface, you might not gain information from it. But if somebody was reading music that directed them to do that, then it would carry a profound amount of information. Because there are hundreds of bad chords and only a few good chords. When it's less organized, you have more to work with. Nevertheless, our brain prefers the unambiguous case, and that's why we like certain chords. One of the best piano plays I've played with was uh, this guy from Palermo, uh, 
subatomic group family. His idea of a G minus 74 was A and B flat. <laughs> That was advice from jazz saxophone player George Garzon. In case you didn't catch that, he said that one of his favorite piano players played a G minor chord as just A and B flat. A traditional G minor chord sounds like this. And this is that piano player's way of playing it. Sometimes the music that we listen to lets us know the exact answer. It tells us if we're supposed to feel happy or sad unresolved, or scared. But with just an A and a B flat, you don't know what you're supposed to be feeling. Think of all the chords that fit over those two notes. Even with some context and melody, you still need to think to figure out what the musician wants to say. And that's the definition of high entropy. It's no coincidence that, according to our analysis of neural firing times, this is a high entropy interval. When Claude Shannon introduced the concept of information entropy, he called it that because the disorganization of information is clearly analogous to the disorganization of matter, which we call entropy in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. But maybe there's another similarity between the two. In matter, entropy always increases on global scale. And this is just a result of statistics. If you drop food dye into water, there's only one state where all of the dye molecules form the word bird, but there are trillions of states where the molecules look random. So over time, they'll tend to look random. This is the second law of thermodynamics, but maybe human culture follows a second law of information. I mean, modern films, music, visual art, literature, all of it depends on ambiguities that are left up to us to understand. A single spoken sentence can contain so many layers of information that are completely absent in something like a computer programming language. Even day-to-day -day functions like determining if somebody is lying, or if they understand you, are all difficult to process because human speech has such high entropy. But listening to music might be our way of training for that. So jazz music and AOA drumming really aren't that different. They both train us to process difficult information. And that might be the best benefit that music gives us. Of course, you can't listen to hard music all the time. <laughs>